Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Aisha Tyler. The Tron Cole Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz, Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! What's up? What is up? It's your host, Elia Einhorn. I am joined today at our studio in Bushwick, Brooklyn, by the one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend. Mike Tyson. Oh, no, it's God. me. That's me, actually. It's Nick Dawson. <laughs> sorry, for, sorry for the disappointment. Nick Dawson, editor in chief of film here at the Talk House. It's been a minute. You have been doing some pretty amazing traveling. I have in small aircraft, uh, on bicycles, under the sea, you know, kind of rail travel. It's been epic. Oh, oh you mean the, the LA Comic Con trip? Well, that was one of them. Yes. I was at LA Comic Con. Now, Nick, this was your first Comic Con. I am no longer a Comic Con. Uh, Noob? <laughs> what was the scene like, man? This is one of the legendary cons. It was wild. It was uh, overwhelming, definitely. LA Convention Center is like, you know, all of the football fields put together. Whoa. More nerds than I've ever seen. Let's just be <laughs> honest here. And we're fans of the nerds here. I love the nerds. I, I, I think I'm a, we are I'm part a passionate of the club. nerd myself. Yeah. And uh, I got to up my cosplay game for next year. <laughs> <laughs> now, Nick, you were out there putting on a couple of live talks at the event, including the one that we're airing today, Felicia Day and Jonah Ray. Tell us how this came together. Well, I was thinking like, whose names rhyme with each other? Roxanne Gay. Uh, Roxanne Gay. Yeah, we were missing Roxanne Gay. That would have <laughs> made it powerhouse trio right there. But these guys are friendly. They uh, are both awesome. Felicia Day, Jonah Ray. I mean, you know, Felicia Day. Who, who can argue with Felicia Day? I mean, not Buffy fans, I'll tell you that. Not Buffy fans, not fans of the Guild, not fans of Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog. She's done so much as an actress, as a creator. She's got a, a new book out, Embrace Your Weird, Face Your Fears, and Unleash Creativity, her second book. She does it all, and uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan. And of course, she is currently on the iconic Mystery Science Theater 3000. With Jonah Ray. And Roxanne Gay. And Roxanne Gay, who is now the new host of that, of yeah. that show. <laughs> no, but, but all jokes aside, Felicia and Jonah are uh, not only friends, but co-workers. Yeah. Jonah is, as this podcast conversation, is perfect testament that he is a hilarious dude. He's done all kinds of, all the comedy things he's done, basically. The Meltdown with Jonah and Kumail. He's one of the, the three hosts of the Nerdist podcast. He's got his very funny Jonah radio podcast. He's been on, I don't know, every single comedy show ever from Conan to Marin to Drunk History and The League. And he even played Tyler on Better Things this year. Indeed. Fortunately, you don't have to listen to this, but I was up on stage introducing these guys and I could have spent the whole hour <laughs> going through their resume. Both have exhaustive resumes. They've worked so much with so many awesome people. Fortunately, I dragged my ass off that stage and let those two people talk and they were so great. What I love about Talk With Podcasts is that intimate atmosphere that, that leads to like really surprising, compelling conversations. And I always have this thing of like, well, if they're on stage, then obviously there's gonna be, they're going to dial it back a bit. Maybe it precludes that level right. of intimacy. Yeah. And yet they were just really generous and forthcoming and funny. It was fantastic. Their conversation covers a lot. We get to hear about the indie movie Jonah's working on about his upbringing in Hawaii, working with Bobcat Goldthwait. Yeah. Talkhouse podcast alum. Indeed. He talked to Lynn Shelton very famously uh, some years back, and he's kind of uh, mentoring Jonah, which is pretty rad. And, you know, maybe needed because we also hear about Jonah's uh, real life dad, who's uh, was a little too coked up at his Little League game. Great story about that. Yeah. Kind of sad, but also very funny. And I feel like if those are the tones of Jonah's coming-of-age movie, I'm fully down. I mean, I'm <laughs> down pretty much for all the stuff that he does, but I think that would be hitting the right notes. Well, speaking of parenting, Nick, you and I are parents, and, and it was very fun to hear Felicia's approach to uh, her kids' bathroom habits. Permissive, I think, might be a term that we could use. Permissive. Very permissive. Yeah. Both of these artists have done a lot of work outside of the Hollywood system, and it was really cool to hear them analyze the pluses and minuses of that. Yeah, it's tough, but you got to focus on the stories that you want to tell. And I think they spoke really eloquently about that. Mm. Also, of course, very important to mention that they do both raise their backup plans, their plan Bs, which I think yes. were hilarious. I won't spoil what they are, but I think a lot of us could be happy doing either of the things that they talk about. We get to hear about the filmmaker that Jonah wants to become. 
And who uh, Felicia wants to be, even though she actually struggles to remember her name. <laughs> how she was not cast on Big Bang Theory. No, no shade. No shade. And how she accidentally ripped off Fleabag. I think that it might be a good time for us to push the play button. Let's push play. Well, so you just put us together because you thought it would be oil and water. It would be magic and mayhem. Yes. Science and magic. But it's essentially, we, we talk so much that I, and now I feel like I'm in a position where this is where I re- accidentally reveal that I don't really know much about you. I mean, is, is that true? I mean, I don't know if I know that much about you. I didn't know that your last name was Rodriguez. It's, uh, it's actually pronounced uh, Rodriguez because it's the Portuguese version has an S at the end. Rodriguez? Rodriguez. Like how my so dad, are you my Portuguese? Dad, I'm a half Portuguese. Uh, my, my dad would always say it's uh, Rodriguez, intrigues. Your dad would say that all yeah, the time? Yeah, so in Portugal, yeah. in Portugal and Brazil, they would say it Rodriguez. Rodriguez. Yeah, so it's also like a lazier Spanish. So it's like... It, um, <laughs> Lazy? Wow. It's just so we know with the pronunciation. Oh, so with it's the pronunciation. Like, uh, so yeah, you don't say Lopez, very... you say Lopes. Lopes. There was a baseball player, Danny Lopes, and then it's like instead of Gomez, it's Gomes. It's kind of like with the French. French, you drop the last letter often. Yeah. And you don't pronounce that. Yeah. And so it's kind of, okay. I w- I've always... So my retirement plan because I frequently think about getting out of this business. Of course. Is either buying a bookstore somewhere um, and just doing whatever that entails or moving to Portugal and learning how to make those tarts they have and just selling them. You know, because I can make a better version of their own tart. Yeah, that's like you just, that would be the most white thing you could do (laughs) is just go, hold on, Portuguese people. Yeah, let me let me show you how to put my American twist. Yes, yeah. the, ang- your... the Anglo is here to yeah. tell you how it's done. Guess what? I'm gonna put a touch of guava in that <laughs> tart, custard tart, guava. Put Malasadas, a little bit. Those are pretty easy to make. rice pudding. Um, mm-hmm. Little tarts. Those are really good. There's a place in the valley. Have you ever been there? Since you're Portuguese now, I know. The, the on the one the little on Portuguese Ventura? bakery. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've been there. It's good. Yeah, those tarts. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how to make them, but that's my that's my backup plan. I think you should stick with the bookstore idea. <laughs> that seems more your Are speed. you sure? What's your backup plan? You have to, everybody in LA has a backup plan, right? Yeah, like I've never asked anybody else their backup plan. I dream about my backup plan probably 30% of the week. Yeah. So that might be an indication. I've been talking to my therapist about it, but it's cool. Yeah, that mine's a daytime bartender. <laughs> What? Yeah. Daytime bartender? Daytime, daytime bartender. So I could work the early shift before it get, it's, it'll be a little sad, yeah. but it won't be irritating. And then like once I'm done with my shift, I just do Is, a real cool thing where I just hop over the bar yeah. and then I sit down at it and then I enjoy well, myself. Oh, and you cheers it out. I cheers it so out. So you're Sam Malone at, the, at if night. If Sam Malone didn't in, get in sober. It didn't get sober. <laughs> yeah. Um, question. So you would be like the Bloody Mary kind of bartender yes yeah 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 brunch bartender y- yes they're like just like you know i'm just doing just stuff. Uh, there's some, maybe some guys some retired guys some vets that come in i talk to them i tell them about when i used to be a comedian in hollywood yeah and they'd be like tell me a joke uh, yeah and, and I, then you can't be funny under those circumstances. i can't I, I go well there was this one bit i had well there was a voice uh anyway uh <laughs> you know shots on me I always, you know, somebody the other day um it was rachel bloom's husband and he has an improv show at ucb and he, I, he emailed me. I was like, hey, can you do my show? And I'm like, sure, when is it? And he was like, 11.30 p.m. And I was like, absolutely not. Yeah. That is the last thing I'd ever do with my time. That's right before you wake up for the day. Yeah, that is like so, <laughs> it's closer to my bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> closer to my wake up time than my bedtime. Yeah. And I was like, listen, I would love to do your show. Why can't you do a brunch version? Because there's not a brunch improv out there. It's also why I never did, I did one class of stand up. And I went to the one open mic that was at 2 p.m. on a Sunday. Mm. And then I stopped doing it because I'm like, I'm not going out after 8 p.m. That's crazy. It's, you were never, you never went out at night? No, I get like a little night with blindness. I don't like it when cars shine their lights in me. I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's so shiny outside. Oh, yeah. Felicia's part deer. <laughs> <laughs> I am part deer. I mean, you did a lot of stand up, right? Yeah. Yeah. I did it for, it's, you know, I never wanted to be a stand up, but I just, that was the only way I knew, like, could see how to get into uh, showbiz. Express, express yourself. Yeah. It is nice. I mean, it's like you all, you have your little kit and you're just going out like by your by yourself. Well, you know, it is a nice thing. It's, it's a great thing, a skill to have now. Like I think we were talking about rec- recently where it's like between jobs, yeah. I can now just go out and, and do a, a set. And do a set. And you don't, do you like write, do you constantly update your material or you just have your 20 minutes that you like, this is what I use? No, I constantly always, I just write really slowly. So it's, uh, you know, there's just like everything... <laughs> 
because I, I don't do stand up enough these days to really like n n you know do a t tight five. Yeah, you're on like a tight. Yeah, so you just. Uh, but I have a set I can do. Okay. And, and I can I can make it longer or shorter. You have a backup thing. So I did a, I did like five minutes of jokes and I was like this is so much more work than I ever thought it were would. Were they be. jokey jokes? Or were you? No, doing? I mean they were kind of jokey joke, but they weren't like cheat. They were more charactery. I mean, do you they remember any good. of them? Nope. <laughs> do you though? I really don't. You don't. I did it right before I had my baby, and that those hormones oh, basically so that made recently. me. Yeah, well, I did it right. Okay, so I tried last. My la I did my last book. My last book came out in 2015. It came out in October, and right after that, I tried to get pregnant um, mm -hmm. with IVF, and it did not work a couple times. And I was so upset about it that I like took six months off, and I was like, I'm gonna have a me year because I was like, my body is so messed up from producing thousands of web videos. Um, and so it's a lot I, of stress. It was too much stress. It really was. My 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 uterus was like, nope. You know. <laughs> There's a child here. I mean, it's an embryo. Listen, it didn't, it didn't want to happen. Um, so then I was like, well, I'll just take five months off. <laughs> There's a baby in the thing. I'm sorry, guys. Um, and it's that's not truth. like the baby knows what that sound. Or, Hopefully not. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I just took six months off. And part of that was working out. Like I went back to dance class and I took a stand. I was like, you got to do something that you know, get you back to being creator. Cause I was such, I was producing all these videos and like, it was just like, what are people going to like, you know? And I didn't really think about what I wanted to say. And I was like, well, stand up seems to be a great way to yeah. like, find your voice. Would you agree? Yes. No, totally. Um, you know, I, uh, I started doing it when I was 20. I had moved out here when I was 19 with the uh, idea of going to, I wanted to do ground links. Oh, and, wow. um, but I went to the class and it, it, I had this idea of what I thought it was going to be like in my head. It was going to be this amazing comedic, you know, community and everyone's going to oh, know my... Food. Yeah, and I was, like, I was like, I'm going to make a Kiss in the Hall reference and a Mr. Show reference. Everyone's going to know exactly. I'm going to find my people. Yeah. And it was just a bunch of uh, actor types uh, that, you know, who, like I remember I was like, I'm like, who, what's your favorite sketch comedy show? And the guy was like, uh, my agent told me to take classes here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that it was, was it when know. I moved here, yeah. Like around, um, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's sad because you think that would be, a, uh, that was really kind of not a good community. It's kind of, well, I don't think, even UCB, like get in UCB and take it. I've taken classes everywhere over the years and not once have I been like, this is, I'm thriving creatively. This is a great environment to thrive. Well, what it is though, it's a, it's a bit of a, it's, it's just working out. It's like, you know, doing comedy, live comedy, uh, sketch and stuff like that. I, I feel at this point, it's just a, it's a gym for a lot of people. Yeah, it's yeah, staying yeah. active. Um, I don't know about a click. I mean, it can be a click. It can be part of a community. Like a lot of jobs I've gotten have been off of people that I've met through comedy. So that's cool. Yeah. But like, I think it's just the idea of um, you're always performing. So when you do get a job, you kind of, uh, you know, you're ready to go. Yeah, I should do that. And you're always out. You're always out just kind of uh, in, it's it's a way to, you know, like the idea of like Nick Kroll right now is out doing a stand-up tour. Yeah. Nick Kroll has a very, you know, amazing career as an actor. And now he has like, you know, multiple seasons of Big Mouth yeah. on Netflix. It's doing really well. And he, he just decided to do stand-up. But he's always kind of been doing it. Uh, you know, he's been, he was an improviser. He would do stand up, but now he's still doing it just because he, it's something that he has the sole control over. That's yeah, what's great about stand up. That's what I was thinking. If I wanted, I wish I could go out at night because then I was like, I think you would really like this, Felicia. I just, I found when I went to open mic night that all the men were so angry and hostile that I was like, I don't want to be around these people. Yeah, it's a terrible, open mics are terrible. <laughs> It is the, it's like, it's, it's like, if it was a video game, it would be the boss level first. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Because nobody's thinking about anybody but themselves. Yeah. And they're like daring you to be funny. Like, oh, you think you're going to be funny? Show, make me laugh. And I'm like, no one's going to laugh under those circumstances. No. I would, you know, I was, I had a, uh, I had a bad uh, date not too long ago. Uh, I remember it was the same, it was the day of the Oscars, I think. Oh, God. Uh, and I remember I was, uh. I knew some people that were, you know, up for awards, and I was like, I was like, what am I doing? I'm just at home watching this while my friends are being, you know, famous. famous. And yeah. then, and then I it was like, you know, good. I'm gonna take my destiny in my own hands. I'm just gonna. There's a 5 p.m. open mic at a bar in Silver Lake. <laughs> hey, I should go over there. The, yeah, the exactly. Place before eight. No, if you want, if you think the one you went to was angry and hard, uh, uh, this one was, it was it was terrible. And I was like, I was thinking, you know what? I'll just, you know, I'll just do some jokes I know work. Yeah. And then that's it was just kind of cheating. And then I went and I tanked. It was I wow. bombed so hard. It was, and it was, it was terrible. But it was only the people, because they're only there for their own workout. Yeah, like, yeah, why, exactly. Why, it's like uh, Simone Biles just only doing flips for other top competitive gymnasts, right? Yeah, exactly. They're, they're like, like, great. Do, 
Um, I saw 15 flaws there. Yeah, exactly. Like, there's no joy there. Didn't stick the landing. Yeah, didn't stick it. Well, you moved your foot a little bit. She's amazing, though, yeah. by the way. But you were you you grew up in Austin, mm -hmm. which was... Uh, when so, it was cool. When it was cool. I'm sorry. It's yeah. an old person thing to say. <laughs> Apology not accepted. Yeah. Um, the, the, but, like, that's, that's a showbiz town. They you got know, a lot of showbiz stuff there. I got into film because of Ro Robert Rodriguez and uh, Linklater. Yeah. Because they had the, sort of like a thriving indie community mm -hmm. where everyone was like, yeah, we're rebelling. We're doing indie film. Like, And there was a, uh, a film festival I, I, I uh, basically was involved with as a, as a volunteer. And that's how I got into the film business because I was like, this is what film is. We're all rebelling. We're all doing things out of the box. And I was like, oh, boy, that didn't happen. But the, when, that's, uh, that's, you know, it was clearly uh impressionable like it's like you you were you took that diy aesthetic that those guys are famous for and then you took that to hollywood and then didn't use it for a bit and then you ended up going like you know what it's time to make my own thing so you I were never added that up before <laughs> you were completely influenced by uh, the austin indie scene i was just like you were the kids in the hall yeah now did you now the thing about comedy is to me i always and i feel like this is a dumb sort of if you, if you get in a click, because I you say that other comedians hired you, and I've always been like that person outside at the window kind of looking in like, hey, I'd like to be part of your world. FOMO me. You yeah, know, like, yeah. And I, I, I see that the same people hire, especially guys oh, tend sure. to do yeah, that. Oh, sure. Yeah, as, as a white dude, it's, uh, you know, because there's so many of us and we're interchangeable. <laughs> So, like, it may look like the same guys are working all the time, but it's a, just a different unshaven white guy. Yeah, but you guys hire group. each other because it's like, well, Seth Rogen always plays with the same dudes. Yeah. Like, and the, and the UCB guys always play with the other, the same UCB guys. You know, yeah. it's very, it's like a tight-knit group. They're like, oh, I know who to call to play with. And it's like, how do you get in? The, I've always felt very fomo -y because I was like, I let me in. I like, I want to be in. But yeah. I feel the same way. Like really? I feel like I was never. I was like tangentially always near these scenes that kind of came up, and then wasn't really. I always had to go out and make my own stuff. Cause, yeah, you know, like, which you do well. I mean, if anybody, you. Uh, you know, that's one show where you, the travel show was like one of the funniest things I've ever seen you do. Like, thank you. Uh, it was it was so funny that you were playing a character, but not really. It was very subtle, and I feel like maybe it was too subtle. For for the world, sure, yeah, you know, I wanted to make it as dry as possible. I did a, a Hidden America, which was like a travel show, a Bourdain parody, and I did it was called Hidden America with Jonah Ray, and the idea was uh, like after I did those commercials for Bing dot com, you were so famous for a minute. I was just for a I moment. I was like, whoa, it's Jonah. He's rolling in cash right they now. They didn't give a lot of money. Uh, oh, that's yeah, awful. Because it was Bing. Yeah, it was Bing. Yeah. If you don't know what Bing is, Google it. Uh, yeah. Is it around anymore? Yeah, it's still there. Oh, boy. Is Ask Jeeves around anymore? Ask Jeeves is, yeah. I don't know. I got to check my, see how many more uh, hours of AOL minutes, uh, <laughs> <laughs> internet time I have. Check my favorite Jeeves. Yeah, but the sense. show was you kind of parroting those, but not in a way that it would be like, because you know, I think comedians, especially American comedians, always go to the most like obvious comedy style, you mm -hmm. know, and it's like, Martin Short doing a travel, like, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. no offense, but just gouge <laughs> my eyes out, right? Like, there's nothing subtle there at all. Yeah, so I you, wanted, the idea of it was if someone, and I, that's why I was such an innocuous name, like Hidden America, you know, just, I wanted it to be, if someone was flipping around and saw that there was a travel show, mm -hmm. uh, that it would take them, like, a little bit longer than it should to find out that it was fake. Yeah, and it was, because I watched it, and I was like, wait, is this, Oh, that's really funny. And then you had so many good guest stars on. Yeah, Weird Al. Yes. Anthony Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain himself. Yeah. Which I was like, I can't believe you met Anthony Bourdain. Yeah, he he's, was great. He's a hero. Yeah, uh, Randall Park. Randall Park was yeah. in it. Yeah, that was a great. How many episodes did you do that? It'd be about 16, I think. 16? Wow. Yeah. And you pitched it and just, uh, you produced it and you did everything, right? Well, yeah, I, I, I pitched it to True TV. Yeah. Um, and then uh, True TV had us do, uh, they wanted us to do a scene. They're like, can you just like produce a scene so a we can scene? get an idea? I was like, well, that's not going to show the whole idea of the show. Yeah. So me and the uh, production company I was working with, Troy Miller's company, like he was like, he's like, let's just like stretch the dollar and we'll make an entire episode. We'll make a pilot just to show them what we mean. Wow. And then so we did that. We, you know, I, called in a ton of favors and then when we were we're like hey we're about to send in the uh the, the fake travel show idea and they're like no the funny travel show what and i was like no no fake travel show they're like oh okay i think we misunderstood you wait what <laughs> yeah and then so they didn't really get it and then of course uh, a digital platform named CISO came and went they, but you know that's the sad like we have a lot of streaming things happening right now and yet 
I'm sure, you know, we were both on the front lines of streaming platforms failing in a terrible way. Yeah, the original Super Deluxe. I was there for that. Oh my gosh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Social Super Deluxe. Um, there was one involved with my company as well. And it was just not a good way to build a, a business. And yeah. yet every single person is building that business now. Yeah. It's What's going to happen? I don't know. How long will Quibi stand? I don't know. <laughs> There's, I, who knows? Like that's at least different. I don't know what to say. Um, with CISO any of these actually things, though, had some yeah. really good shows. They had some great shows, yeah. But it's like with any of this stuff, it's, you know, it's not... It's not well. You had your own company, so it was your money. But for in my case, it's like I know I, all I want is to make stuff. I know. I don't, me too. Yeah, I don't care if you know what channel it's on. Where it's like I like want people to be able to see it. I would love to make a video again. Yeah. I mean, we're sitting here talking into microphones, which is the only way to make anything independently right now. <laughs> and podcasts. It's not that riveting. No, no offense, podcast listeners, but. It's a big old bubble that's going to collapse the same as any other bubble that happened before. Because, Every time like, I see someone do like a, like, it's like pay for a podcast or like Patreon. And I, I always go the gall, <laughs> but that's no, just my self-esteem. There's one, uh, there was one that I actually do support. I have one, one Patreon and it's the fall of civilizations podcast. I'm uh oh yeah. You were talking about this with podcast the podcast so much. Cause it's the, well, it's so well researched. Yes. I'm like, this is worth $5 a month to pay this guy to research just because I enjoy it so much. I feel that same way about the uh, Secrets of Hollywood History. Oh, that's a great one, too. Yeah, I love that guy's one. So, like, that's okay. You Another know, great we, one with, uh, who has a Patreon, which I'm actually going to is a Tony Thaxton has a great podcast called Bizarre Albums. Oh. They're 15 minutes long. Oh, I've seen those. Yeah, yeah. because they, the weird album, the, like the garbage, you know, not the garbage. Like just kids, novelty like, records. Novelty or like records. When Shaq, you know, Shaq put out a rap album. Yeah. Or when Terry Bradshaw put out a country That's album. That's a great idea for a podcast. Chipmunk punk. I mean, what is great about podcasts right now is that somebody who is an expert or has a passion for something really specific that hasn't been highlighted can yeah. have a platform and find an audience and make a living. Yeah. That's like, cool. Like if someone like, you know, wants to listen to two narcissists talking to each other, they can listen to this podcast. Yeah, exactly. Right now, just like yeah. basically. Uh, You're great. You look great too. I love your work. Would Thank you like you. to tell? Would you like to tell me about how much you like my work? Would you like me to tell me about my work? Yeah, I'd like you tell. I'd like to tell you about your work <laughs> in context of your background in Hawaii. Hawaii. Now, why? I feel like you should write that indie film about somebody growing up in Hawaii. Yeah, you know, you know who's pushing me to do that? Who's uh, helping me with it right now? Is Bobcat Goldthwait. Oh, what? Yeah, Bobcat Whoa, Goldthwait. Whoa, you just dropped a name. It's on the floor. Pick it up and tell me about well, it. Well, I guess it, it's it's no... Uh, uh, oh, man, I forgot her name. Uh, what was the girl from uh, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend? Oh, yeah, Alina, uh, uh, Aline. Oh, Rachel Bloom. Rachel Bloom. Rachel Bloom it's Bloom, no yeah. Rachel Bloom's husband of a name drop, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, no, it's exciting. It's, it's, I say I say that this is why I like that. Uh, there, I, Eric Idle put out a book recently, and it's all name dropping. And, oh. I, and I, in my head, I go, "That's what I want to hear." Yeah, I don't want to hear. It's like I'm not going to name names, but this person did this thing. I was like, "Name names, coward!" I know. When I wrote my memoir, people were like, "Well, you could have talked about the supernatural cast a little bit more." And I'm like, I felt really bad about exploiting my friends for my own my memoir. And then, like a couple years later, I'm like. Oh, I missed the mark there. <laughs> yeah. But you could do that's like that's why when you you have to put out the other when I'm ready to burn the this tell place, all yeah when I burn my Hollywood career to the ground move to Portugal make those tarts make those tarts uh, my little twist southern twist it could be like a chess pie tart you know just <laughs> adding my little <laughs> oh boy what a jerk yeah <laughs> uh, so you're working with Bobcat Goldwaite yeah he's he's helping me uh, with the script uh, um, to kind of help formulate so he, like, really Bobcat Goldway, who was, of course, he was a you know, huge comic in the 80s but he's also become yeah. a, a very great indie film director I had no idea yeah he did he's done like Willow Creek which was like a Bigfoot um, found footage one that's really great he did wow. one with uh, called God Bless America uh, which is problematic now it's about people going on a shooting spree um, okay. I guess was, you know what it was problematic at the time probably always problematic yeah. but that's okay <laughs> yeah but he did did a one called World's Greatest Dad starring Robin Williams. I had no idea. Yeah. I had no idea he was a director. Yeah. That's exciting. It's a good, one person it's, yeah, yeah. loves that movie. You saw World's Greatest Dad, right? I remember that movie. Rest in Peace, Robin Williams. Rest in Peace, Robin Williams. Rest in Peace, Robin Williams. Like, Williams, yeah. That was like the favor that, you know, then that movie is like, like Bobcat makes incredibly dark, weird of course. movies, but like that one was basically um, this guy who was like a failed writer, uh, Robin Williams, who's a teacher, he's an English teacher and he wanted to be a writer and he has problems with his son. He has, he's just a single dad and his son's a real jerk and then his son ends up uh, dying because of autoerotic asphyxiation. Oh my God. And he's like, he doesn't want to be embarrassed by that. So he makes it look like his son just hung himself, but then writes a suicide note that becomes like a sensation. What? And then they're, they're like, wow, you're so much such a beautiful writer. He's like, well, he did write a book, I think. Oh my and God. And the whole thing is like, it's like him writing his novel under the guise of like, that his it was his son. son. Yeah. 
Okay, that is so dark. So are you yeah. writing the uh, equivalent it's of so that? It's so dark. It's, it's so, so dark. dark. Yeah, yeah, he makes he makes weird movies. So your movie's gonna be that weird? No, I don't. It's not gonna be that weird. But okay. like you know, but it is. It's it's. Are you a gonna tricky. star in it? Or are you gonna? Step I might. Up, step I might back? pull. I might pull like a Taika Waititi and Boy, where I'll <laughs> I'll, I'll play my coked up dad. Oh. Uh, you know, and then I'll get some kid to play. Was your dad yeah. coked up? Yeah, some of the times. Really? Yeah, one time um, I got uh, struck out, and he was my little league coach. Yeah. And I got struck out by uh, the pitcher who, uh, who was d- his dad was the coach of the other team, and then the umpire behind uh, home plate was uh, that coach's dad. So. Uh, this grandson of this umpire is like just throwing balls over my head, bouncing in front of me, strike one, strike two. Uh-huh. And then uh, I swing at the third one, strike three, I'm out. And then my dad loses it and then like what? goes out. He's, he's like, that's it. No, we're off. We're good. This, we're done. We're going off. It's like and pulling all the kids off the, wow. the field and like throwing stuff around. And like, um, and he was like, you know, he was clearly like a little amped up, but it was, he was, it was, he felt wrong. And it was, it was, I mean, kind it, of was it sounded thing. like a dick thing to do to a kid. Yeah, I, I think so. And then like, I remember, um, I started to cry because of how intense of a situation it was. And yeah. then some kid turns to me, he goes like, he's like, hey man, we all strike out sometimes. And I was like, that's what you think I'm crying about? <laughs> So my dad's a maniac. But, yeah. But he was, it was great. And like, you know, it was just, it was just there, there's clearly antics and there's issues. There's antics. Um, so yeah. there's issues around your dad. Not only his behavior, but. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think. That's yeah, well, interesting. Like my mom was a little bit, uh, um, she would have a really bad temper. And so I have no temper whatsoever. Like I'll be like, oh, great. You wronged me. That's fine. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> you know, so I really have no point at which I, I really lose my temper. Except if you wrong somebody else, I'll get mad for other people. Yeah. But for me, I'll be like, well, I deserved it. Or, you know, I'll put up yeah. with a lot. Yeah, I'm so the, it's really uh, yeah. interesting. Because if you have a volatile parent like that, you learn to sort of be like, very controlled because you don't want to set them off, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's kind of how my mom was uh, in a way. I mean, I love her, but yeah, she was a little bit of kooky boot. So, so like I have a kid and for me, I always, I try not to be, you know, provoked in any way. I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, great. So you want to run around with no pants on? That's fine. You're going to poop on the floor? That's great. You know, that's your choice. And so I, I yeah. hope, and then she, when she grows up is going to be like, wow, you are so boring. So maybe. Yeah. You think? I don't know. Do you, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I'm not going to have kids, but uh, yeah. this, this seems like a good way to do it. Let them do what they want. Let them tire themselves out by pooping all over the floor. Yeah. I mean, you'd think that she'd learn how to use a toilet if you poop enough on the floor. Nope. Yeah. Do yeah. you make her clean it up? Do you do it like a dog? You go, look no, what you did. I would not do that. No. <laughs> look at Look at Look. This I almost me. feel like I'm, tr- I'm really. Have you ever stepped in it? Uh, No. I mean, it's not that many poops. It's just like two or three, but it's enough to sear a memory. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And to let people know. To let people know. Now yeah. everyone knows about Felicia's kid. <laughs> She's Pooping two years old, y'all. It's not like she's 15. Not for long. <laughs> she's a 15-year-old and she really yeah, just steal yeah. poops on the floor. Yeah, she just, uh, she just poops on the floor giving you the middle finger. Do you feel like all the stories that are important to you are very personal like that? or Because I, I have come to the conclusion that I can't fake it for Hollywood. I can't be like, I'm going to write a sitcom about a bunch of nerd characters that Hollywood would like or yeah. uh, or about, you know, I have to have something really super Real subtle personal. shade thrown out a sitcom. No, I, no, <laughs> whatever. I was never on that show, but I should have been one day. <laughs> I was supposed to audition for one. Sh- well, actually, there was a character that I was supposed to go audition and I was shooting the Guild season six during it and they cast another redhead girl there, whether I would have gotten the part or not, because we had all had to audition. But I, I always am like, wow, that was my, the, the, the one redhead. That yep. was all that you get. One yeah, yeah. redhead. <laughs> one head redhead or show. But yeah, back to what you were saying, though, about the, uh, like, the uh, authenticity through your yeah. work and stuff like that. Yeah, like, it's like, you know, I'm uh, writing that show, uh, that script for BBC in England, and yeah. it's, it's just... Just dropping a name. He's writing a script for BBC. I'm trying to, like, listen, we were, just we did a panel in. in front of people. She got to say... You know, what was it Suspiria? What was the Supernatural? Supernatural. I just dropped Supernatural. And I was like, you know, Supernatural. Like Supernatural. I was like, yeah. Yeah, and you're just sitting there, yeah. And I was like, I was like, yeah, I'm on her new show. <laughs> I'm on the, the puppet one with the bad movies. <laughs> Um, I'm just trying to show my worth here. No, but I feel like if I was a professional screenwriter, quote unquote, I would just be like, okay, that one didn't sell. Let's think of another one. Okay, uh, you know, uh, I could say that I grew up in Texas. It's a Texas comedy. Like, I can't do it. Yeah. That's just not my personality. Mm -hmm. I I recently pitched a TV show that I thought was like, okay, if I can't sell this, I can never sell anything. And it didn't sell. And I'm just like, 
I'm not gonna take it personally because I'm like, I know it's a business, but I'm like, I'm not like, let's get back on the wagon and find something else that's real personal for me that they can stop all over. Yeah, there's a lot where it's like, you give so much of yourself to a thing yeah. and then they go, we don't like it. Then you're like, then you don't like me. That's that's how I kind of- I'm well, worthless. Yeah, I, I, I kind of took that personal thing out of it, but then I'm just like, I don't want to keep handing you my babies and having you throw them in the dumpster, right? Yeah, exactly. In a sense, so I don't know. You gotta know, let them roam free, poop yeah. all over the floor everywhere. <laughs> Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. But it's uh, you know, the stuff that like we do. It's like you know, we we like we were talking about earlier. We play versions of ourselves. Yeah. And you know, it's like you know, the guild is clearly. Bio, uh, like, it's autobiographical. Yeah. yeah. Anything that I come up with, I try to put something personal in. But yeah. um, and the, like within America, for me, it was like uh, it was like all the petty thoughts and feelings I had towards the industry or myself in certain situations. I just inflated the worst parts of my personality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a, it was very cool. I felt like it was actually not you at all. Like it was a really interesting yeah. interpretation of who you are. You like amplifying but just the worst all elements. the worst parts. Yeah. Yeah. Bitter Jonah. Yeah, yeah, was exactly. Very prominent in that show, which yeah. I thought was really great because unless you, I think in order to deal with all those like things that you feel, you ha you can't just hide them, right? You can't yeah. just not be angry all the time. You know, you you have to allow yourself to experience all your emotions in order to be healthy. Mm -hmm. And so if we can get that out through art, so maybe I just need to really draw write about a really angry character. Yeah, I think there I think there's some anger in you. I'm pretty. I mean, I'm bit. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I have some anger. But do you feel that you're sometimes afraid to show it like publicly or within your work because uh, you're really well known for being kind of uh, amiable, amiable, bubbly. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. it's like everyone, you know, everyone, you know, like you know, thinks you're like a really nice person. You are really, yeah. genuinely are. And I, you know, I, I feel that way sometimes. Where it's, you know, sometimes people think I'm really nice, and so I feel I have to play up yeah. that aspect. It's hard when you're a personality and you know you're known as a person. Versus like, then you're like, like there was a kid in here earlier and it's like, well, I don't want to do something that has all this profanity and like adult situations because that kid is a big fan of what I do. Yeah. Do I willingly either traumatize that kid <laughs> because they're going to watch something they shouldn't or do I just be like, yeah, you're not important to me. You know, I mean, yeah. that's kind of like uh, doing like all women things in a sense. I've always kind of avoided it because uh, I feel a lot of camaraderie with women. But at the same time, I don't want to alienate or, or shut out men who like my work as well. So yeah. I'm always really careful to be like, this is for everybody. But, you know, as an artist, you have to be willing to alienate people in order to do some work that pushes you forward in a sense. Yeah. It's, it's not, it, you know, the stuff I've really liked, you know, music, movies, stuff like that. It's, it's, very, it's very niche for the most part. Yeah. You know, like I love gory horror movies. Uh, I love noisy music. Yeah. Uh, and... And then you know, there's a thing when I start putting stuff out, and when not, no. when not. He said noisy music. Metal. I like metal. metal. I like power violence. Death metal. I like death metal, like thrash. Uh, yeah, <laughs> 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 yeah. Like I'll I'll listen to stuff. Where it's like I'm sure this guy right here under like it's like <laughs> there's stuff that you can show. You're like it's like I like this band, and then people go, this just sounds like literal noise. <laughs> Like, where is it? It's just like, you know, it's like, yeah. it just. That is not my appeal, but I appreciate people who <laughs> yeah. like what they like. Yeah. And it's like, it's like, I like that stuff, but, uh, and I, and then, and then I'll get into a mood where I'm afraid. And I was just like, well, like, well, someone doesn't like it. I yeah. go, but wait, I, there's people that hate the stuff I like. So yeah. why, why do I, you know, I try to keep that in perspective. It's really, it, it's hard when you're like trying to decide on what where to concentrate your creativity yeah, and to decide, like you have all those external reasons, like, well, it's not saleable. I don't know how to, you know, uh, I don't know if people will like this. I don't know if I like it because you're not even centered in yourself very much. Mm -hmm. You're just always thinking about the external reception of whatever it is you haven't even made yet. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's acceptance. It's uh, the same thing with, you know, we, we don't want people to hate us. No. And so it's, and we, um, as long as you want to build on your success because, you know, in certain ways, I kind of regret ending the guild when I did, even though it was probably time, but I ended it because I literally didn't have help doing, I mean, I literally did everything on that show. I had a, a co-producer, but like- Did you not have help or did you not ask for help? I I was no, I mean, that's a good point. Like I, I wasn't willing to be like, I just need somebody to come in here and help me write this and like really workshop it. Cause I didn't know what I was doing at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wrote everything myself in my garage and my, in, you know, by myself. And we were also started a company where we were supposed to release a video a day for, you know, so it, be, it became a situation where I was like, I don't have the artistic space to really 
write this by myself and I don't know how to scale upwards, right, yeah. in a sense. And so, but when you find success like that, it's very rare. You're never yeah. going to really be able to duplicate it because very few people even find something that resonates with other people. And so you kind of want to write it until the wheels fall off. And so I regret most of all, like the whole time is not, I had a PR person tell me, don't announce it's the last season because you might want to do a TV show. So I avoided doing that in the press. And then when it ended, it was like, sort of like, what? Everyone was confused, including me. And yeah. so I don't have a lot of regrets. I have a new, my, in my book, my new book I talk about, there's a whole section on regrets and like, you know, everything I am right now, I'm really proud of. I'm proud of my baby. I'm proud of uh, all the things that I've accomplished. So like any regret where we would have changed something about our past, we wouldn't be this person we are right now. And yeah. I would never change that. But the things that I stick out in my mind of like, you know, just career wise or where, when I didn't follow my instinct and follow my own advice versus other people's. And so yes. I don't know if you feel that same way. All the time. There's a lot of stuff, um, you know, a lot of people in my life that I've uh, had over the years where uh, I've listened to them thinking that they knew better than me. Yeah, and they 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 had you know their idea of what I should do because um, my parents were pretty loose, you know. Like, um, I mean, Hawaii it, doesn't feel like a real uptight state. <laughs> no, no, it's real. You know, it, I didn't I didn't have very strict parents at all, and so I think I was looking for that in m mentors over the years or people or just looking for some kind of yeah, tell um, me how to be parental figure. Yeah, to be like it's like is this good? Is this how I should do this? But that's like the worst thing to do in Hollywood. No, no, like there, there is like the like the kind of easy mentorship stuff that happens, but you also have to really know who you are and how you want to do stuff. Yeah, and that's that's very important. It's uh, when you were saying like when you ended the guild and you didn't really know how to ask for help. Um, there's something in um, uh, Steve Martin's book Born Standing Up where he talks about where he was just it was like the height of his career and he was on the road all the time. And he looks back on it now. He's like, he's like, there's. I'm realizing now there was a million things I could have done to make it easier for me. Yeah. I could have brought out friends on the road. I could have like broken up the tour. I could have, you know, done the show differently. I could have scaled down. Like he's like, but at the time, you because know, he was yeah. just so overworked, mm -hmm. he wasn't able to figure That's it out. That's exactly what I, I, in retrospect, I'm like, there's so many things I could have done. But at the same time, you kind of have to live that A and B you find a lot of us find success like in a surprising way when we're not really ready for success, mm -hmm. right? And it doesn't matter how much you've done. You have to be in success to realize how crushing it is in a sense yep. because then all everyone's like looking at you and there's all this pressure and they, everybody wants a piece of you. And like, I have such a hard time saying no. I would just literally do anything for anybody because they were trying to essentially use my success to help their own success yeah. in a sense. And where are they, you know, when you're falling a little bit, nowhere to be found, right? Yeah. But I didn't know at the time. I was just like so eager that anyone wanted to play with me. I'm like, sure, I'll do your, you know, web video. I'll do anything, you know? And so, yeah, I, I, I feel like you have to kind of go, there's nothing that could prepare you for that. You can just yeah. have to hope that, oh, I get another success. Yeah. And therefore I can learn all these rules and, and things that I learned along the way. Um. There to was, the best of my ability. There was, you know, when I was starting off at comedy, the people that I was doing a lot of the same shows with, um, here's some more name dropping for you. Ooh, but it was like, it. but one of them was uh, was BJ Novak. Drop it. BJ Novak from The Office. Drop it. Dropping it. <laughs> <laughs> but like, but like BJ Novak was there. And then, um, and then, you know, like, like Dan Mintz, who went on to be voice of Tina and Bob's Burgers and, Ooh. and then Morgan Murphy, who like, you know, runs TV shows now. But there was this thing where it's like, they all like took off um, really early and young. Like, yeah. it's like, and I remember being like, it's like, oh, I remember being jealous. I was like, oh, why, where's, when's my shot coming up? Yeah. And I plotted along, but then as I kind of just worked and like worked on myself and my, my craft and my, you know, my, my creativity, I saw this fatigue set in with a lot of them. Yeah. Like, it's like they hit it so early, so hard that they had to now keep that up. Yeah. It's exhausting. And then it's like bouncing a ball in the air, right? Yeah. You're just like, your arm gets tired after a while and you want to do something different, but nobody wants you to do anything different from what you did before. Mm -hmm. And then if you try it, it's not as successful because people only reward what they kind of like about you. And yep. that's just what it is. And it becomes a little bit, um, like you want to disappear and just garden or bake Portuguese tarts, Portuguese right? Portuguese tarts, yeah. Or you just- At your library. Yeah, but I think when you, re like for me, reaching that point of like, I really could not do this anymore or I could do it, it's a kind of freedom in that, you know, maybe I'll occasionally get a sting of like all my famous, more famous friends doing amazing things yeah. and like, oh, I've never worn an Emmy dress. Like that'll never happen for me. Like you have these moments where, and that's a fine to feel that. But then at the same time, like I'm only going to work on the things I really, really mean something to me. And if I don't 
necessarily make it to that social scene again, yeah. or if I make it at that income level or fame level, I'm still going to be a good person. Mm -hmm. I feel like that is where I'm at right now. And I feel so good about it because I could do anything and I'm still a good person. Whereas 10 years ago, I'm not a good person. Yes. I'm not a good person at all. If it's like, oh because God, yeah, those, you those people at that Hollywood party. Cause at the end of the day, Hollywood never really embraced what I did anyway. Yeah. Nothing I did was like, hire that girl. I mean, except for some really great acting parts as a creator or whatever, a producer. It's like, you, you work outside the system, that's fine, but you're outside the system. Hollywood yeah. only likes things they can use for themselves. Yes. And that's fine. You just have to know that's what you're signing up for. Yeah, buy the ticket, take the ride. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what is your goal? I mean, what is your dream to, I mean, like, what if you were to wave, wave a magic wand and like, what would be your thing that you would do uh, or to, or creatively? It just, I guess essentially I would become Albert Brooks. That's all I like. <laughs> wow. It's like if I could just his have his- His hair would look really weird on your head. It would look, yeah, yeah. It's really uh, weird. Albert Brooks with less curly hair. Uh, yeah, I like the idea of writing and directing and acting and, and my weird movies or the movies I like to do. Mm -hmm. um, that I just, you know, because I like all aspects of uh, the process. I like sitting in an edit bay. I like, you know, like the things we've done. Yeah, like all, I love know. editing. I love yeah. putting friends in things. Yeah. I love just like making stuff. And, I, you know, as having an as opportunity to help out people is like a huge part of what makes this stuff feel uh, worth it sometimes. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Like when I get hired on a, a random job, I'm like, okay, I'll do it to make health insurance but at the yeah. same at the end of the day i don't really i mean i'm more excited that you know somebody's cosplaying a character that i you know created that's like a weird inner meme of like a tabletop you know character you yeah, know yeah. it just came out of nowhere because that's more spontaneous and it's like i i feel like being on a, a wide platform is never going to be comfortable for me as a person mm -hmm. um even though you're like looking at people like uh who do stuff like that uh, I don't know. I mean, Kristen Wiig really is, I think, the template for something. Like, she really worked outside the system a little bit. I mean, she still does, like, tons years. of indie movies Yeah, all she the does time. indie movies. I knew her. Like, I did improv with her back uh, in the day. And dropping a name. There you go. Um, but she uh, is so lovely, and she struggled because yeah. she doesn't look like everybody else. She doesn't wasn't going to book sitcom after sitcom mm -hmm. because she didn't look like that, you know, peppy sitcom girl. And then she made her own path, right? She yeah. she made her own characters. And of course, being on SNL, of course, helps. But, you know, doing Bridesmaids, that was her script. Yeah. You know, she worked on for years. And it just, you know, she defined herself in a way that I feel like doing TV almost is not, a path to do that. I feel like I've kind of concluded that yeah. because like movies, you're right. Like you can really just, this is my thing. The beginning, middle and end are determined. I don't need your help to make this happen yes. necessarily. This is a closed system. Do you want it or not? Yeah. TV is essentially a, a process of um, asking for permission to paint. Yes. You know, it's just a thing where you like, you're like, well, I have an idea for a painting. Uh, we'll go to this place because they have money for the tools and stuff like that. So you go into this place and you go, I have an idea for a painting. It's like a cafe at night. It's a little blurry. And they go, okay, <laughs> can you do us like, can we give you like a couple, uh, you know, francs and then you'll, uh, you know, yeah. like you'll or just maybe do a it's sketch not a cafe, it. it's a zoo. And yeah, you're like, no, zoo, okay. zoo, that's cool too. I can make it, yeah, make yeah. it work, yeah. Uh, then, so you can, and then like you go, what about this? They're like, okay, let's try and like, let's put a little color in there. Okay. Uh, you yeah, which it. color should I do? Well, yeah. we don't like vermilion, just do a little bit more chartreuse. Yeah. yeah. Can it be sharper? The lines be sharper. Well, that's not really my aesthetic. Uh, <laughs> and then suddenly it's just something else. Yeah, and then like when it's done, they're, they're like, you know what? We don't want it. And like, okay, can I have the painting back? No, we're going to lock it away so no one can ever see it again. Yep. <laughs> Yep. And that's that's trying that's developing TV shows. Yeah, I've done a, several pilots, and like they'll never see the light of day. I can't even say I wrote them, and I'm just like, oh, okay, uh, I got paid well, and I'm so unhappy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so unhappy. Yeah, but you know that's that's but that's the business. You can't like I I think you know like I said many years ago I would be bitter about it, and I'm, I've been bitter about it. But I'm like just just like you have to accept that the business you can't change the business, right? Mm -hmm. You have to accept the parameters of the business. And you just balance it with what you want to do on the side. Yes. I mean, you doing a BBC pilot and doing your own movie, like that's exactly. Oh, that's just, don't bring that up. It's so embarrassing. Oh, the BBC boy. pilot. Oh, boy. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Okay. I have a <laughs> BBC pilot. But uh, no, that stuff, it's, uh, and then, fi you know, finding creative ways to like still, because it's like sometimes just the process is fulfilling enough. And so finding small stuff, like for me, 
you know, I have like a nice little editing app on my iPhone. Uh-huh. So I like, you know, shooting videos and putting music to it or when I did the Weird Al cover thing. Oh my God, that you know? was so great. It was just like a thing to do for fun. Yeah. Specifically for fun. And like it, like it got a huge response because I think people felt that it was like a genuinely fun well, thing to that's do. That's what I miss about web video. I mean, web video is like, oh, we just have an idea. We'll go shoot it tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And then you put it out and like, yeah, maybe like not everyone isn't a hit, but like you, you have like a spark of, you have that spark of like excitement versus because it is spontaneous. Mm-hmm. It is like somebody giggling and making a video. You don't have to have 17 people approve it, right? Yeah. And that's the sad part because I, I mean, I, I'm a, I left my company a couple of years ago because I felt really not creatively fulfilled in a way that I could just do that kind of stuff because there was really no, you know, it was more of a non-scripted kind of thing that had turned into. And that's totally fine. We did great stuff there. But like doing just a weird sketch or like, you know, being able to be spontaneous and just fun. And I, I, it was not just happening. And I was like, I can't do this anymore, but I'm going to go do it somewhere else. And I was like, oh wait, no one's going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause you get to a point too. when you know, our communities and our friends start to, you know, the friend that you like that wanted to be an editor. Yeah. Um, now they're a professional editor and yeah. you're like, Hey, do you have any time this weekend? They're like, I, I can't nope. help you with this thing. No. Nope. You know, it's all your, all your free work starts to Yeah, they disappear. I mean, yeah, you could still get a group together, but yeah, it's just, uh, and it it costs something. And I think, you know, if you look at the- Pizza, it costs, it used to cost pizza. And now we're old. We're like, no, we need actual, you need I can't, I can't. Can you maybe order from- Yeah, can it be Mosa? Tender greens. Tender (laughs) greens. I'm on a no carb diet. I'm a no carb diet. Um, Who, who would be your dream person to work with? Like, do you have a dream director or a dream actor that you would like, oh my God, I'd die to be in a thing with them? Yeah, I think, uh, well, right now it's Taika Waititi. Oh yeah, I'm just, that's mine too. <laughs> I think, you know, and that's another, like, it's, I could re- easily just go like Albert Brooks or Taika Waititi. Yeah, you want to yeah. be him? My friend Harvey's on What We Do in the Shadows and like, I couldn't be more jealous. Not jealous, but like, I'm just like, you're on the dream show. Yeah. You're the, this is the one TV show that I would want to be on in, yeah. in existence. What about you though? Like, what's the person if you could just like, Magic wand B. Oh, B? Yeah. Like a magic wand B. Um, whose career would I want? Uh, wow, it's really hard. I mean, I love Amy Poehler because she does all the things. I, I know that I wouldn't just want to be an actor because yeah. I do enjoy acting, it's but I, I, I need to be more active and I, would, I want to be behind the mm-hmm. scenes. I want to be involved in like the creative decisions around it. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I love, uh, I love that... Um, that uh, I love the girl who I can't remember her name, the one who's directing Little Women. What's what's her name? Oh, uh, Greta Gerwig. Greta Gerwig. Yeah, yeah, she's great. You know, she got cast in a How I Met Your Mother sequel. That's right. That never went, and evidently it was kind of because of her, because they were like, she's not a TV star, and I'm like, no, bitch, she's an amazing auteur. Yeah, she well, she's like you know great. Like she was in tons of great indie films. She yeah. was in House of the Devil, which but is an amazing she, movie. But she tried to do mainstream. Yeah, and it didn't fit because. And it, it, it didn't fit because she tried to get in the system forever yeah. and it just didn't work because that wasn't her flavor and that wasn't her path to success. And yeah. she did her own thing. Lady Bird is a great movie. Oh my God, so good. Yeah, so I guess, you know, I guess she's not an actor anymore. Like, remember Sarah Polly as well? Yeah, Sarah Polly. Yeah, she became uh, more of a, became a director. Yeah, and she amazing she did an amazing movie. The called, one with Alzheimer's. The one with the Alzheimer's. No, no, no. It was the one with the uh, Seth Rogen um, oh. and Michelle Williams. It's called Take This Waltz. Oh, I never saw that. Which one. is like I think a Leonard Cohen line. Ooh. Um, but it's like it's it's such a brutally sad, amazing movie. Wow. And she's you know, she like. It's such a well-directed movie. Yeah, I guess um, I just named two directors, but I've never directed anything. So. But they're also actors, though. And, yeah, I, actors and, I, and I don't doubt of... that Greta Gerwig w- won't go show up in. Oh, I'm sure. You know, some David Gordon Green movie. For sure, whatever. for sure. Uh, but yeah, like, the, like basically, it's like every time I talk to like my reps, like they're like, "What do you want to do?" And then I, I have to kind of just be honest and go, "I want to do everything." And I think that's kind of <laughs> how you feel too. Yeah, and you go into a meeting and uh, you go to an uh, agency and they t- have 17 agents in a room because they're like, "Well, you do all these things." I'm like, "You're not going to help." me with any of them yeah no offense but you really do little work you yeah. just kind of open the door and let the offers come in and like uh i fired everybody who works for me uh several months ago and i'm very very happy about it because i just need some space yeah to figure out what i want to do next and with people always knocking on the door with terrible audition uh, you know opportunities and like kind of making me feel guilty that i'm not like pitching a tv show that they approve of yeah and, you know, God bless them. They're really in the business of it. And that's probably what a mainstream person would want. But 
I kind of would, I, I just want to do a one woman show or like direct, you know, a small indie movie I can do in my backyard. You know, that, that's Phoebe Waller bridge. Yeah. Oh my God. You know, I wrote a pilot where everyone talked to the camera and it was six months before, um, Fleabag, Fleabag. came out and mm. I was like, well, burn this one. <laughs> just burn it. You can't do it without looking like a ripoff at this point. Cause yeah. she just was like, bam, it's mine. And yeah. I love it about her. And you know, she was told over and over again, she looked weird. Yep. She needed to fix her nose. Yeah, um, she was rejected so many times. Yeah, exactly. And like, look at her. She did her own thing. She did so. her own thing. She took that show uh, to Edinburgh. Yeah, uh, and the and woman, and she got horrible reviews. Yeah, she got horrible reviews. And she somehow got an opportunity to put it into a TV show, and it's like brilliant because. Yeah. It, and the thing about it is, because I I tell you all this time, I was like, oh my god, the BBC, because they actually do things that. You, the U.S. people would never buy. Yes. And yet those are the things that really resonate because they're more authentic. They're more individual. They have a lot, you know, because American comedy, like, let's be honest. I mean, I loved Seinfeld and like multicam when I was in the 90s. Like yeah. 90s sitcoms are my template as far as like my, I adore them. But sitcoms today are just like, there is not one I would be, I would want to sit through a whole, you know, episode of. Yeah. You know, Big Bang had, had great moments, right? Mm -hmm. So, but there were not one other. And I'm just like, what happened? Why? Because nothing sneaks in. Nothing sneaks in. So it has to be like, you know, for all quadrants involved. All quadrants. Like, yeah. Seinfeld, I didn't even know this. There was like a 20 minute presentation that was funded through the sports section. Oh, weird. Yeah. It was a sports executive who has a discretionary fund. They tried to bury the whole thing. And um, they just insisted that they, they air it. It was, it was buried in the worst time slot. Mm. So that the network hated the show. They hated it and they tried everything they do could sabotage it. Jeez. And then suddenly it becomes great because it was like nothing else that was on the air. It was given a chance. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Well, That's a, you know, another person that I, I would, one of my have in her career is uh, Sharon Horgan. Oh, she's incredible. Yeah, so she did a divorce. She made divorce. She's not in it, but she pulling, also did a- Pulling, uh, if you've never seen Pulling, her oh, first yeah. show, it's like so incredible. She's the star of it too. Oh, yeah, yeah. So she kind of toured it out. Catastrophe is great. Catastrophe is amazing. Yeah, This Way seen, Up is her new, uh, the new show she's I don't know producing. how she has that many, I don't, I don't have that many TV shows in me. Yeah. It's too much work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <gasps> um, I guess we should probably wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, this has been super fun, though. Yeah, I didn't thanks know. everyone for watching. Yeah, there's uh, a lot of people watching us other. talk to each other, there's which we were here. doing downstairs at our signing table. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> do we take quick? What is? It? Do we? I guess we're done. We're done, right? All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Felicia, Jonah. Please give it up for these guys. Thanks, that was, that was Fantastic. Thank you so much. Felicia Day, Jonah Ray, thank you so much for joining us here on the Talk House podcast. Nick, you put together a hell of a show, my friend. It was all them. They were amazing, and I thanked them warmly and effusively at the time, but I thanked them again because they are fine people. And we want to also give big thanks to John Aguilar, Sheldon Price, and Ariel Stepp, who helped so much out in L.A., and, of course, L.A. Comic-Con. Thanks for having Talk House out. Yep. Let's do it again. Love those guys. And, of course, we have to give... Major props to our heroic engineer, Ali Niku, who was my rock during LA Comic Con weekend. And big thanks to our co-producer here in New York, Mark Yoshizumi. Nick, I know we have some great pictures from the event. We do indeed. Those guys take a mean image. That's what I say. That's the way people speak, right? Listeners, you can find those on at TalkHouse across social platforms. And uh, I want to give a big shout to The Rage, who composed and performed our theme song. Nick, a couple names that came up in this talk who have been on the show before. As we mentioned in the beginning, Bobcat Goldthwaite. Indeed. Spoke with Lynn Shelton. Go check out that old episode of the podcast. And, of course, someone that was alluded to in this talk is one of the owners of the TalkHouse podcast coveted 3 P trophy. Kamel Nanciani. Indeed, Kamel was uh, on the podcast three times and he was, uh, as you say, alluded to. He was one of the, the friends of Jonas who was up for an Oscar, of course, for writing The Big Sick. Also, while we're on this sort of big family of LA comedians who we love to work with, Dan Greger, AKA Rachel Bloom's husband, wrote an excellent talk house piece called My Porno Tape Story. Well worth checking out. Find all these at talkhouse.com. Till next week, I'm Ellie Einhorn. I'm Nick Dawson. Peace and cosplay. <laughs>